Hey everyone, Ricardo here, and in this video I'm going to be showing you how to create a power system model using the ETAP software. We'll be developing a model for this example substation, which includes a utility system equivalent, a power transformer, an overhead transmission line, an underground cable, two feeders, along with all the relays for the protection of all of this equipment. So ETAP is one of the most popular software packages for modeling power systems, and running different types of studies such as short circuit, protection coordination, and arc flash studies, just to name a few. Now probably the most important step before running any type of power system study is to develop an accurate model of the power system. And that's of course because if there's inaccurate information in your power system model, then all of the results in your power system studies are going to be wrong. So that's why in this video I want to show you how to create an accurate power system model using the ETAP software. Now just real quick before we get started, make sure to download our Protection and Control Fundamentals PDF. It's a 28 page PDF where we go over all the fundamentals about power system production and control. So make sure to check it out. The link is in the description below. All right, so let's jump right into it. Let's see how we can model a power system using the ETAP software. All right, so again, we're going to be building this entire model using ETAP, but we'll do it step by step. So let's open up ETAP and create a brand new model. I'm going to be calling this model example power system. So let's go ahead and create a blank model. And it just takes a few seconds for ETAP to initialize the software. And we have over here basically a canvas for our blank model. Now, before you start building the model though, it's important to gather all the necessary information of all the equipment at the substation. So what I've done over here is I've created this spreadsheet in which I have all the information in one place. Typically, you would get this information from nameplates for the equipment, test reports, the utility that you're interconnecting with, or other manufacturer provided information. And again, over here, I have the utility equivalent, the transmission line information, the transformer, the underground cable, and the feeder load information. So you need to put all the information together so that when you build your model, you have everything that you're going to need to model the substation. All right, so let's jump back into ETAP and in here, Let's go to the edit menu that's here on the top left. This is where you can edit your model. All of these other modules are for running different types of studies. We're going to get to that later, but to build the model, you have to go here into the edit mode. All right, so first let's model the utility equivalent. You can see over here on the right that you have all of your different equipment that you can model. And in here, I want to search for a system equivalent. Now you can see over here that this is sorted by AC equipment and also DC equipment. Of course, I'm gonna to go to AC equipment and the block that I want is this one over here, which says power grid. So this is gonna model my utility that I'm interconnecting with. So let's go ahead and drop that into the model and let's zoom in a little bit more. And so this is gonna be the starting point for the entire model. Basically, you would get this information from the utility and it would give you the short circuit information at the point of interconnection with the utility. And then you can model everything downstream from that. So in this example, again, in my Excel sheet, I have the information for the utility equivalent over here. It's a 230 kV system. The three phase fault current is 5,000 amps with an X hour ratio of 10. The single line of ground fault current is 7,000 amps with an XR ratio of 12. So we're gonna model that into our model. So let's go back into this and let's double click on the power grid. And here I'm gonna call this just U1 equivalent. So basically a utility equivalent. And again, what this does is it models the utility behind the source. So they give you the information at the point of interconnection of your substation in this case, but basically wherever you're starting the model and wherever you're connecting to the utility. So I'm going to call this U1 equivalent and where I want to go over here is to short circuit. Now for the purposes of this model, we're going to be focusing on the information that's needed for short circuit and protection coordination studies. We're not going to go into raceway models, cable modeling, other than what's needed for short circuit and protection coordination studies and also for arc flash studies. So basically anything related to short circuit. Now in here, again, I go to the short circuit tab and here's where I can model the information. So actually let's go back to rating and in here I have a 230 kV system. So this is a 230 kV utility system at the point where we're starting our model for the substation. So the rated kV is 230 kV. Then we can go into the short circuit. And again, this information you would get it from the utility. For my case, I have that the three phase short circuit current is 5,000 amps. 
the x over r ratio for that was 10. And let's go ahead and change this. This is actually in Ka. So I need to put 5 instead of 5,000, which is why it switched the numbers when I put 5,000 in. So 5 Ka, meaning 5,000 amps. 5,000 amps at 10 x over r ratio. Now for the one phase or single line to ground fault current level, that's gonna be 7,000 amps at an x over r ratio of 12. So again, seven and 12. Now, knowing what the rated KV is, which in our case is 230, when you enter these numbers, ETAP auto calculates the impedance for our utility equivalent. So all you have to do is to enter the fault current levels, the X over R ratio, and then it knows by using the voltage level what the impedance needs to be to match those numbers. You can also enter here the MVA short circuit. Sometimes it'll give you the information in MVA rather than KA. So it just depends on how you have the information. In my case, I have the fault current levels rather than the short circuit MVA. All right. So Again, 5,000 amps at 10 X over R ratio for the three phase faults, 7 Ka at 12 for single phase faults. And we can see over here that we have our impedance auto calculated. So let's go ahead and click OK, and that models our utility equivalent. Now, the next thing that I wanna do here is to place a bus at this point. So I can go over here to connectors and I can click bus. Let's drag that into our model and we're gonna connect that to the system equivalent. I'm gonna call this T underscore sub for transmission substation. And notice here that ETAB already knows that the KV for that needs to be 230 KV. And that's of course, because we connected that to this source and then we defined that source at a voltage of 230 KV. So it knows that since you made that connection, this bus therefore must be also at 230 kV. So let me actually move this down a little bit to make more room here. We're gonna need this for when we run faults. And now we have our bus for the interconnection to the utility. The next thing that I wanna do here is to model the transmission line. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go over here to transmission line. We're gonna drop that into our model, connect it to the sub. And let me actually move this down a little bit. Let me actually get rid of these connections. So I'm gonna put this transmission line down here. And then let me make this connection back again to the source. So we have over here our overhead transmission line. If we go back to our Excel sheet, I have the information over here. This is basically a transmission line with a length of 0.1 miles. And the type of conductor is what's called a Pelican conductor. And that basically is just a name for the size of the conductor. Now I can go over here back to my model. And in here, what I can do is I can double click on this. I'm gonna call this line one. So I'm gonna leave the default name over here. And in here we can tell ETAP what the length of this transmission line is. In this case, it's gonna be again, 0 0.1 miles. Now if we go over here to parameters, you can see the conductor type, the resistance, the reactants. All of that is empty right now because we haven't entered any information for this transmission line. So what I can do here is I can go to conductor library and in here, I'm gonna search for that Pelican conductor. And that's actually gonna be under EPRI multilayer. And let me scroll down over here. Here's my conductor Pelican. So notice over here that that's basically a name that is just standard in the industry to tell you what the type of conductor is. In this case is a conductor with a size of 477 kcmil and 18 strands. So I'm gonna hit okay. And now notice here how all of this auto populated. That's because I told ETAP what the length of the transmission line was, and it knows what the parameters for that type of conductor are gonna be. And then it just takes the length that I told it, multiply that times the resistance and reactance per unit length to give me the values over here for the impedance, both reactance and resistance. So now I can go ahead and click OK. And again, here we're focusing, let me go back into this menu. Here we're focusing on the information that's needed for short circuit information. There's other stuff here. You can see here that you can go to sag and tension. For example, there's information over here. You can go to opacity. So we have more information over here. Again, here we're gonna be focusing on short circuit, which all I need for that is impedance information. So all I care about here is these numbers over here. So let me go ahead and click okay. 
And now what I actually want to do is place a breaker at this location. So again, I can go here to AC equipment here on the right and I can find a high voltage circuit breaker. So I'm going to drop that into my model. That's going to go over here connected to the transmission line. Let me actually call this T1 high side breaker. So I'm going to call this T, T1 HS CB. Actually, let me call this BKR breaker. Now again, here there's information for the rating, reliability information, you can put comments. There's a bunch of stuff here. For the purposes of this modeling, I just wanna have a breaker there that I can operate with the relaying that we're gonna model later on. So all I care about here is the name. Again, you could, if you wanted to, just put rating information over here. For example, you can make this a three cycle breaker instead of a five cycle breaker for the interrupting time. You can change your max KB to match whatever your breaker is rated at. So there's more information over here. For the purposes of this modeling, I'm just gonna change the interrupting time for the breaker. I'm gonna make this a three cycle breaker, which is pretty standard for a 230 KV breaker. And that's gonna add a little bit of time to our clearing time when we model relays. All right, so I'm gonna place another bus over here next to the breaker. So let's put a bus over here and let's connect it to the breaker. I'm gonna call this T1 high side. So basically this is just gonna be the high side of our power transformer. And again, ETAP knows that this bus is connected to a 230 KV system, so it already populated that over here. So let me just go ahead and click okay. And now we can model our power transformer. So again, let's search for that here in our menu on the right. And there's a main menu over here for transformers. I'm gonna pick a two winding transformer, which is what we're gonna have in this example. Let's connect that to the bus. And in here, of course, we have to enter some more information. I'm gonna leave this as T1, that's gonna be the name of our transformer. And of course, here we have a bunch of information that we need to enter. First and foremost, we need to tell ETAP what the secondary of the transformer is. It knows that the primary is 230 kV because it's connected to a 230 kV system. Now it doesn't know what the secondary is because we haven't told it that yet. And of course we haven't connected this transformer to any bus on the low side. So it doesn't know what it is, so it's just put in zero for now. Again, going back to our spreadsheet, I can go to the transformer tab over here and here's all the information for my transformer. In our case, for this example, the secondary is gonna be at 13.8 kV. So I can go back into the model and I can tell ETAB this is gonna be a 13.8 kV transformer. And notice over here that the full load amps of the transformer says zero. That's because I haven't told it what the MVA or the power rating of the transformer is. In our case, this is gonna be a 100 MVA transformer. And once I click on that, you'll see that it now auto populates the full load amps and it can calculate that because it knows what the voltage is on the primary and the secondary. It knows what the power is. So it can calculate the full load current on each one. Now, the other important thing here is, of course, defining what the type of transformer this is. In this case, I'm going to say that this is a liquid filled transformer per IEEE C5712. I'm going to say that this is a mineral oil type transformer and the class is going to be one with two stages of forced air cooling. So you can see over here that per standard, if I tell it that the OA rating of the transformer is 100 MVA, then it knows that at the first stage and second stage forced air cooling, per the standard, the rating for that would be 133 and 167 MVA. Again, all of that is per standard. The other thing that I wanted to put in here is the impedance information, of course. And again, from our spreadsheet, I have over here that the impedance is 10%, X over R of 34.1. So if I go back to the ETAP model, that's actually gonna be the typical Z and X over R information. Basically over here, I'm just putting typical information for a transformer of this size. Now you would get this information directly from the nameplate of the transformer. So it could be different. You can also find this information sometimes in the test results for that transformer. So you would just need to get this information from the manufacturer for that specific transformer that you're modeling. In this case, I'm just gonna leave this at a typical level for a transformer of this size. Now, the other important thing here is what the tabs are for this 
transformer, I'm going to leave both the high side and the low side at the nominal taps. So basically the high side is going to be at the 230 kV tap. The low side is going to be at the 13.8 kV tap. However, if you have a different tap position for your transformer, you could enter that information over here. So for example, I could say that the high side maybe is on the 235.8 kV tap, not on the nominal 230 kV tap. So you can adjust that here if you needed to. And sometimes you have to do this in different projects. They might decide that it is a 230 kV to 13.8 kV transformer, but maybe the high side tap for whatever reason needs to be at a higher tap or a lower tap. That's information that's specific to every substation, every project that you're working on. You would just need to get that information from the EPC company typically. So whoever's building the substation or the power plant, you will get this information from them. Now, one other very important thing for short circuit studies in particular is the grounding of the transformer. Of course, you always wanna model this correctly, but when it relates to relaying specifically, this is actually very, very important because this will greatly affect the fault current contribution, especially for ground faults. So in our case, I have a transformer that is connected in a DYN1 configuration. What this means is that the high side is on a delta connection, the low side is on a Y connection with the neutral grounded. And in this case, the delta leads the Y winding by 30 degrees. So high side leads low side by 30 degrees. So again, going back to our model, that's actually the connection that I have over here. So I have DY 30 high voltage leads low voltage by 30 degrees. So, and of course you can adjust this if you needed to. Now, this again, is important. I wanted to tell ETAP what the grounding type is. In this case, I'm gonna have a Y solid grounded winding on the low side, but this could be resistance grounded. It could be reactor grounded. It could be open, so a Y open connection. It could be many different connections. You need to match this, of course, to whatever is actually in the substation. In this case, this is gonna be Y solid. So let me go ahead and click OK. And actually, before we do that, again, there's more information over here for short circuit. The only one that matters in addition to what we just did is this one that says protection. And mainly here, I wanna see the inrush point. So basically this tells ETAB when you model this in a TCC, in a time current characteristic curve, where do you want to see the inrush point in that curve? In this case, ETAB is defaulted to eight per unit at six cycles. I like to see this actually a little bit higher at 12, just as a worst case for making sure that your protection does not trip on any rush. And we can leave that at six cycles, that's pretty standard. So this is typically the numbers that I use, 12 per unit for the current level at 0.1 seconds. And again, that's gonna plot it when you plot this in a TCC curve. And you would of course need to make sure that your overcurrent curves do not trip for that condition, because otherwise you would trip every time you enter your the transformer. So just something to watch out for. I'm gonna click okay here. And now we have our transformer modeled. Now we need to model the low side bus. So again, I'm gonna draw this bus over here, connected to the transformer. I'm gonna call this T1 LS for T1 low side. And again, ETAP knows over here that this is gonna be a 13.8 kV bus because I connected it to the secondary of the transformer, which I already defined that to be 13.8. So let me click OK over here. Let's move that a little bit higher over here. And now I wanna model the cable that goes from the transformer to the substation bus at the 13.8 kV level. Now to model a cable, I can just go over here to my AC equipment and select a cable from here. I'm gonna place that over here, connect it to the bus. And let me actually get rid of that connection and that actually connected it above the transformer, which is not what I want. So let me get rid of that. Let me get rid of this bus. Let's put the transformer back over here, connected to the bus. And let's place the cable here again. So again, cable is gonna be connected to this bus over here on the low side. And I'm gonna call this, let's open this up. Let's call this cable one. And now I can't call it cable one because I just deleted a cable which is in my trash in the ETAP model. So if I try to name this cable one, ETAP gives me an error saying this ID already exists. The name of course needs to be unique. 
So the reason why it's saying that is because I had placed the cable over here and deleted it, and now that's in the trash for the ETAP model. ETAP kind of saves everything that you've deleted just in case you need to get it back, and there's like a trash bin in the model. So let's just rename this cable. Let's do UG for underground cable. And let's actually rename this high side transmission line as OH T line. So overhead transmission line. Just to kind of keep it consistent with the naming over here. So the underground cable, again, we need to model that, of course. And again, the information for this is in the Excel sheet. This is going to be a 750 kcmil size conductor. 300 feet long, there's going to be 12 conductors per phase at a rated voltage of 15 kV, and the type is going to be aluminum. So let's go back into the model, and in here I'm going to say, let's actually go back to info. We're going to say, again, that this has 12 conductors per phase. Now, usually when you have cables, you might have to parallel cables to get a more opacity level. So in this example, we're going to have 12 conductors for each phase. So there's going to be 12 conductors for A phase, 12 for B, 12 for C. And that's going to give us a bigger opacity for this cable. And so now that we've told it that, we can go over here to library. And again, this is going to open a library for ETAP where we can select the type of cable that we have. And then ETAP is going to auto calculate the impedance from that. And again, we said that going back to the Excel sheet, we said that we had a 15 kV rated cable that's aluminum at 750 kcmil size. So what we can do here is we can sort the type for aluminum. I can sort the rated KV for 15. And over here, I'm gonna select one conductor. So now over here, I can go and select, for example, this very first one. So aluminum, 15 kV, number of conductors, just one. So let's select this, and then we're going to select the size as 750 kcmil. And again, now if I go to impedance, you can see that ETAB auto calculated the impedance for that cable based on the parameters that I told it. Again, all of this depends on the information that you give ETAB. If you select a different size over here, for example, that's going to change these numbers over here. So you have to match your size for your cable. You have to select the type, the rating. All of that information, ETAP is going to gather all of that and from its library is going to calculate the impedance based on that information. So one last thing that we need to do here, of course, is to select the, or rather to enter the length of the cable. We said that this was a 300 foot cable. So let's go ahead and click OK. And now we have our underground cable modeled. Now after this, I want to put another breaker here on the low side, which I'm going to call my main breaker for the substation bus on the low side. So this, let's put this over here. I'm going to call this M1 BKR for M1 breaker. Again, this is going to be the main breaker for the substation. Let's put another bus over here. This is going to be my substation bus. So substation bus and notice over here that the KV is till zero. That's because again, I haven't connected that yet to this break over here. Once I connect it, it automatically knows that that bus needs to be at 13.8 KV. And of course, that's because this part of the system, the low side of the transformer is at 13.8 KV. So it already knows that that must be at 13.8 KV. Now, after that, let's go ahead and model our feeder. So I'm going to expand this a little bit just so that we can fit our feeders down here. And I was trying to make this somewhat symmetrical so your model looks just a little bit nicer. It's always helpful to have a model that's organized and that it's not all over the place. So just try to keep your model, everything aligned, everything organized, and everything with names that makes sense. All right, so let's model our two feeders. I'm going to need two breakers, one for each feeder. So let's go ahead and put those over here, two breakers. This I'm going to call F1 BKR, so feeder one breaker. Let's do caps F1 BKR. And I'm going to call this over here F2 BKR. And let's go ahead and put those over here. So we're going to connect them to our bus. 
And again, let's try to make this a little bit aligned. I don't want these grouped. So let's put this one over here. Let's put this one over here. So now I have my two feeder breakers. The next and last thing that I want to do is to model the loads for those feeders. And you can find loads over here. I'm gonna use this lump load. What that means is that we're gonna use just a lump load instead of individual loads. And we're gonna model the entire load for this feeder that way. So let me go ahead and enter the information over here. For this example, the two loads are gonna have the same information or the same type of loads that is. So let's go back into the Excel sheet and the loads. Again, of course, are gonna be 13.8 kV. The power factor is gonna be 0.8. And these actually are going to be 40 MVA loads. So let's put that over here. We're gonna say parent power. That's gonna be 40 MVA. All right, so going back to our load over here, let's double click on that. I'm gonna call this feeder one load and let's go to nameplate the rated kv of course is going to be 13.8 we said that we want that to be 40 mva and the power factor to be 80 so 0.8 and of course etap auto calculates what the megawatts and mvars megawatts are going to be based on the mva and the power factor and it also tells you here the current because again you gave it what the power was, you gave it what the voltage was, so we can calculate current from that. All right, so that's it for that load. Let me actually make a copy of that. So you can just control C, control V, put that over here. So let's make this connection over here. Let's put the loads over here. All right, so that's it for all the equipment at our substation. We have the utility equivalent. We have the overhead transmission line, the high side breaker, the transformer, the cable, underground cable, the breakers around our substation bus, and then two feeder loads. The last thing that I wanna do over here is to place a few faults just to kinda of make sure that our model is working properly. So let's go over here to this module that says short circuit. And again, we were in the edit module, which is where you edit all of the model. This is where you enter information, put all the ratings for all your equipment, all that kind of stuff. When you go to the short circuit model, this is meant to be only for running studies. In this case, short circuit studies. So let's do a quick check. What I'm gonna do over here, and this is a little bit small, so it might be hard to see, but you can run short circuits in all of the buses in this model. This is gonna do a couple of things. It's gonna try to place faults at every bus, but by doing that, it's also gonna check that there's no major errors in your model. For example, if you have an impedance that's set to zero, it will tell you, hey, this impedance is set to zero. My short circuit that I'm trying to run is gonna be wrong because you haven't modeled this properly yet. So by placing faults in every bus at the substation, you're kind of doing a check already to make sure that there's no major errors in your model. Now it doesn't check, of course, on whether you entered wrong information. So for example, maybe you have a 10% impedance for your transformer, but you entered 9%. In that case, it wouldn't give you an error because that's a valid number for that transformer. But it will tell you if there's like just major errors in your model. So let's go ahead and click that. I'm gonna just click OK over here. And in here, in fact, you can see that it's giving us a bunch of errors, especially related to the overhead transmission line. And that's because we haven't modeled the layout for the transmission line properly so that ETAP can calculate the impedance. So again, it's telling you the line impedance or positive sequence impedance equals zero. That's an error. You have modeled a transmission line that has no impedance. So go back and check your model. So let's go back into our model then. All right, so let's go back into the transmission line and let's see what the error is. So if we go over here to impedance, we can see that there is no impedance over here. The reason for that is that we told ETAP to use a Pelican type conductor. We told it what the length was and then it gives us here the resistance and reactance per mile, but we haven't told the configuration of the transmission line. So it doesn't know how to exactly calculate the impedances because it needs the physical layout for the transmission line. So we go over here to configuration. We can tell it the spacing over here. So I'm gonna use some typical numbers over here. I'm gonna say this is 80 feet high and the spacing between the conductors are 20 feet in between each other. So let's say 20, 20, 20. And now it calculates the GMD. And from that, now it can calculate the impedance by itself. 
All right, so that's the last piece of information that we needed in order to model our transmission line properly. Now, the other error that ETAP gave us when we tried to run a short circuit study is that we actually didn't tell it which bus to place a fault on. So let's run this again, and we should only get that one error. You can see over here that the overhead transmission line errors went away, but it does say no bus is faulted. Of course, it's trying to run a short circuit study, but you haven't told it which bus to fault. So let's go back into our model. And what we can do over here is click on this suitcase over here, and we can tell it, I want to fault. Let's say, for example, let's just fault the T sub, so the high side bus. So let's click OK. We move that over here to fault. Let's click OK. And now let's run the study. And you can see over here that now we have our results for the short circuit. Notice here as well that if I zoom in a little bit more over here, the contribution from this source to a three phase fault at this bus, the T sub bus, is 5ka. That's important because that is matching what we put over here for the source. So if we go over here to source, short circuit, again, we told it that the three phase fault current was 5ka. So of course, if we place a fault right in front of the source, we would expect that fault current to be 5ka as well which is what we're getting over here. So that's just another quick check that you can run to make sure that you've modeled your source properly. Now, the other thing that I wanted to show you here is going to this protection coordination module. Here, you can also place faults, but this is done more so for seeing how protective relays operate based on different faults. So you can place a fault anywhere on the system that you like, and if you have relays modeled, then you can see what the protection is going to do. So for example, if we place a three-phase fault over here at this 13.8 kV bus, we can see over here in the results that no device tripped. Of course, that's because we haven't modeled anything yet. But we can see over here that the fault current at the 13.8 kV bus is 45 kA. That's another quick check I'd like to run. Basically, what I'm looking for over here is that this number is not something outrageous. 45 kA is pretty standard for a 13, around 13 kV bus. That, of course, depends a lot on how strong your source is, the impedance of a transformer, the impedance of the cable, the, the impedance of the transmission line. There's many factors that play in, into what this number is going to be. What I'm looking for here, though, is to make sure that, for example, this isn't 450 kA. That would be way, way too high for any power system. And so if I saw that, that would give me an indication that something here is modeled wrong. Now, if this is in the range of, let's say, anywhere down from 10 kA all the way up to, let's say, 70 kA, that's pretty standard. That tells me that most likely everything's modeled properly. Of course, again, that depends a lot on the information that you have and the equipment that you have. So there's no right number. But if you get something that's higher than 200 kA, for example, probably there's something wrong in the model. One of the impedances was modeled wrong, or maybe the source was modeled wrong. So those are just a few checks that I like to do before moving on. And of course, you always want to double check every single piece of data that you entered. So you would go back into your transformer, go into rating, make sure that your voltages are correct, make sure that your MVA is correct, make sure that your impedance is correct, make sure that your grounding is correct. You always should double check everything that you entered once you model everything. So typically, I just go through and model everything, plus a few faults do a little bit of checking by running different studies, short circuit, protection coordination, make sure that everything looks somewhat in the range of where it should be, and then go back and look at each individual piece of equipment and double check everything. Now, the last thing that I wanna do over here is to actually model the relays. So again, for that, we need to go back into edit mode. And here I'm gonna put a few current transformers so that we can model our relays. So we can go over here to instrumentation, and this is the current transformer block. I'm gonna place a CT over here, just right above this breaker. And let me actually move the breaker down a little bit, and let's mirror this. So I'm gonna rotate this 180 degrees, and I want the polarity to be on the high side. So I can go over here, click on the CT, and go over here to rotate and reverse polarity. And now the polarity of this CT is on the high side. And I wanna do that because I'm gonna model here a transformer differential relay. The other CT for that is gonna be down here at the main breaker. 
So down here, I'm going to do the same thing for here. I'm going to put it on the other side so I can go rotate 180. And now I have my CT on the low side that I'm going to use for the transformer differential, really. So now I can go ahead and put over here differential relay. Let's drop that in here. Let me actually rotate this as well. And in here, I'm going to connect the CT's high side. So this one over here to this connection. And this one over here, again, to my differential relay. So that's going to go, let's say, over here. All right, so I've modeled basically a transformer differential relay. I'm going to call this a T1 relay. And we can go over here to diff, and I'm going to go here onto library, and I'm going to select here Schweitzer. So Schweitzer, and this is going to be a 487E relay. So basically a transformer differential relay from Schweitzer Engineer. Now over here, again, we have the high side breaker, which we called T1 HS breaker. We have the low side breaker M1 breaker. And in here, what we can do is we can say, well, we programmed a differential element. I'm going to actually go back here on overcurrent and disable it for now. And we can say, well, the high side CT, CT1, is going to be connected to diff input number one. The low side CT, CT2, is going to be connected to diff input number two. And notice over here that the primaries are set to zero. That's because we haven't defined what our CT ratios are going to be. So if I go here into this CT, I can tell ETAP that this is going to be a 400 to 5 CT. The low side is going to be a the low side is going to be a 2000 to 5 or rather 5000 to 5 CT. And now if I go back into my differential really I can see over here that in the inputs I have a 400 to 5 CT and a 5000 to 5 CT. I have a differential element enabled. The last thing that I want to do over here is I'm going to select this output and I'm going to say anytime any relay element operates for any level, I'm going to call that my output DO1. And what that output is going to do is it's going to trip two breakers. It's going to trip the high side breaker. So T1 HS breaker and it's going to trip the low side breaker, which we called M1 breaker. And again, going back over here, basically what this is doing is saying, I've modeled a relay, it's reading current from here and here, it's a differential relay, and when it operates, it's going to trip this breaker, and it's going to trip this breaker. And actually notice over here that this CT connections are not made properly. So let me get rid of this first. We're gonna connect that CT there and here. And let's make sure that the high side looks like we have the same error over there. So let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of this. And this CT is going to go from this transmission line to this breaker. All right. So now we can go back into this protection coordination module. And I can place a fault, let's say, on this bus over here. So we're going to place a fault on this bus over here. And we can see the fault currents there. And now we can see that ETAP is telling us T1 really tripped these two breakers. So the 87 element, the differential element on the transformer differential relay that we modeled tripped at 20 milliseconds. Then it went ahead and tripped breakers T1 and M1. And that's again, because we told this model for the relay that whenever it operates, it has to trip T1 and M1. So in this module over here for protection coordination, you can see the results over here again. You place the fault, the differential element picks up, trips these two breakers. All right, so you could of course model a few more relays. You could put another relay over here that's gonna be the bus differential relay. You can put another two relays over here with CTs for the feeder breakers and call those your feeder relays. I'm not gonna do that because it's the same process as we did over here for this transformer differential relay. But basically you can do the same thing, put a CT over here, put a CT over here, over here, connect that to a bus differential relay, tell it that it needs to trip this breaker, this breaker, and this breaker, 
You could also do the same thing for the feeder relays, put a CT over here, put a CT over here, connect those to the relay, tell the relay that it trips only this one breaker, of course, because that's a feeder relay which trips only one breaker, the feeder breaker. So you can do the same process for modeling the, a bus differential relay and a feeder protection relay. All right, so that's how you model a power system using the ETAP software. If you want to learn more about power system protection and control, make sure to check out our online courses where we go over different types of protection schemes in a lot of detail. And as always, if you liked this video and you found it helpful, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos about power engineering and power system protection and control. And we'll see you in the next one.